next on Unsolved Mysteries. FBI agents go undercover to nail a Colombian drug cartel. A rock star makes a desperate call to 911 and then disappears. What happened to Taylor Kramer? A prominent surgeon is found dead in his garage. It looks like suicide, but his mother looks closer and finds evidence of murder. In Mexico City, every year, thousands pray to the image of Our Lady of Guadalupe. Was this painting created by a miracle? Our team continues to track crimes, wanted fugitives, and tales of the paranormal. Perhaps you can help. I'm Dennis Farina, and this is Unsolved Mysteries. In the South American country of Colombia, a life and death struggle has been raging for decades. It's a battle over drugs. And drugs mean money and power. Here, drug cartels have made terrorism and political assassination a way of life. Their violent influence is felt around the world, especially in the US. The cartels leaders of the cartels, the members of the cartels in South America, and their representatives in the United States are particularly vicious. There is no premium on human life. These people make the mafia look like Boy Scouts. They are totally violent. They will kill almost for the sake of killing. Nearly 80% of the world's cocaine comes from Colombia, and the drug lords aim to keep it that way. To fight the cartels, the FBI initiated one of the riskiest sting operations in history. The impact of that investigation continues to this day. During the late 1980s, drug runners sought out the latest communication devices, especially ones that could not be traced. FBI agents set up a small shop called RA Communications that specialized in electronics. Their first customers were quick to arrive. I have some information on your uh, cellular phones. Okay, well, we sell and service cellular phones. We also service beepers and sell beepers. The receptionist, Sandy, and the manager, Jay, were both highly trained FBI agents. Okay. These gentlemen would like to know about our cell phone system. The drug runners came asking for the latest in car phones, ship to shore radios, beepers, remote phones, and airplane telecommunication devices. We did everything we could to provide them. By so doing, of course, we knew how they were operating, we knew what frequencies they were operating on, and it gave us the leg up. Word on the street was that RA Communications had the best in untraceable phones. The drug runners began to trust the people who worked there. This is the top of the line, state of the art unit. We held ourselves out as being a service component of the drug business. Uh, we made it attractive for them to remain, talk, converse, and that became a place to congregate. It took on an aura of a clubhouse type of effect. Our clientele, probably six months into the operation, was entirely drug traffickers. Soon, major players in the drug world began to drop into the RA clubhouse. One of them was a Colombian national named Jesus Peñover, a man who handled regular shipments of cocaine worth as much as 50 million dollars. Jesus came to trust the undercover agents and cooperative parties working in RA communications. He bragged that he'd been involved in some violent incidents in Colombia, South America. 
talked about his desire to flood the United States with cocaine. He freely discussed with us the movement from Colombia, South America, through the Bahamas and into the United States. Inside the clubhouse, Peñolver felt safe enough to make drug deals using the company phone. Peñolver's drug buddies began to join him. It was not uncommon to see three different drug dealers doing business at the same time. One of those traffickers was cartel operative Julio Marco Cruz. Julio Marco Cruz was a customer, a purchaser, someone who was going to receive in excess of 100 kilos of cocaine. The plan called for a large shipment of cocaine to be delivered to the United States on a boat called the Tremolo. The FBI had just enough time to alert the Coast Guard. When the Tremolo entered U.S. waters, they moved in. Kill your engine. I want you and your crew to step to the far side of the boat. We'll come on board. Under the Tremolo's floorboards, agents discovered over 800 pounds of cocaine. The street value, nearly $40 million. The next day, crew showed up at RA Communications with his bodyguards. Amazingly, he seemed to know nothing about the Tremolo's capture. Jay made a quick decision. To keep his cover intact, he told Cruz about the drug bust on the Tremolo. I read it in the paper, bro. It's not a mentira, man. Come on, come on. Cruz was furious, but he never suspected that the men who had told him about the bust were, in fact, responsible for it. He continued to use the same telephones that he had used before, and the FBI continued to gather information. It appeared as if the RA sting might go on indefinitely. But things got tense when Jesus began forcing himself on Sandy. The FBI feared that Sandy and the other agents might be at risk. The agents who are involved in undercover activity are exposed to potential danger at any given time. If, if the circumstances were different, okay? And really, we very closely reviewed and evaluated with the FBI headquarters and the other agencies who participated that uh, we had accomplished a great deal and it was the appropriate time uh, to bring forward the matters to uh, a prosecutive phase. 18 months after they began their operation, the FBI brought charges against nearly 100 drug traffickers. RA Communications was shut down. We had a significant amount of arrest to undertake. We had a very detailed plan. Of the 93 people indicted throughout the United States, we were able to apprehend 68 some people. Julio Marco Cruz, the mastermind behind the Tremolo drug run, was sentenced to 17 years for drug trafficking. He has since been released, but his boss is still at large. Jesus Peñolver, shown here in his 30s, is now in his 50s. He is six feet tall and weighs 165 pounds. He uses the alias surnames of Gomez, Partamina, and Rito. He is considered armed and very dangerous. If you have any information, please log on to our website at unsolved.com. Coming up, a doctor is found dead in his car. It looks like suicide until the victim's mother proves it was murder. Los Angeles, California. Just relax. Officer, you have to help me. My husband, he's got a gun. Police are called to the home of Dr. Ted Losef by his frightened wife, Wilma. She tells officers that Ted is armed. Let's go. Is there keys? The house yeah, I have the keys. Wilma is there with the Losef's housekeeper and Edward J., a family friend. All right, all right. I'll get the clothes. Ted? 
Ted doesn't answer, and there is no sign of him anywhere in the house. It was in the garage that officers finally found the body of Dr. Ted Losef. The car was running, the victim was behind the wheel, and this hose was in the tailpipe. To authorities at the scene, the evidence of suicide was overwhelming and there was no further investigation. No fingerprints were taken, no autopsy was performed, and no questions were asked. <laughs> They found him in his car in the garage. It had to be suicide. It wasn't until a little later when things began to become so suspicious that I wondered about it. Of all people in the world, Ted was not one to take his life. Zell says the discrepancies finally became clear to her in a dream. I saw a garage filled with lots and lots of boat equipment, cartons of boxes, and I realized I was at Ted's garage. And I knew that to put his car there, he had to move the things that were in that garage. Ted had back surgery. It was impossible for him physically and then I saw the gates, these great big double old iron gates. In her dream, Zell remembered that the driveway gates were damaged and difficult to open. Ted had always parked in front of the house. To Zell, the implications of the dream were clear and disturbing. The suicide had been staged. Her son had been murdered. But Zell's suspicions alone were not enough to get the case reopened. She decided to track down her son's former housekeeper, who we'll call Mary. Hello. Yes? Uh, I'm Zell Losef, and I've been looking for the housekeeper who worked for my son, Ted. Oh, Mrs. Oh. Losef. The following reenactments are based on Mary's sworn testimony at a coroner's Thank inquest. You. Oh, that's OK. I hope your wife isn't angry that I wasn't here earlier. Mary says that on the day that Ted died, she arrived around 10 a.m. Ted announced that he was divorcing his wife, Wilda, and that Wilda would not be staying at the house. But around 2 o'clock, she came in. She, she parked her car directly in front of the door, and then she went right upstairs. And then a few minutes later, I heard all this screaming and yelling. And I said, if you want me to continue to work with you, you'll have to talk to my husband. So he paid me for my work. And I got in my car, and I drove down the street. And there was Mrs. Lusser. Mrs. Lusser, what are you doing? Oh my god, Mary, what am I going to do? I can't go back there. And then she asked me if she could go with me. And I said, well, yes. So I drove home. She kept insisting that Dr. Losef had a gun, so I called the police. No, officer. No, I'm not the wife. Well, she said that he had a gun. He had a gun. I saw a gun. She insists that he has a gun. Why don't you come talk to him? They told me that they couldn't go over there if I hadn't seen a gun, and I hadn't seen it. Thank you, officer. I'm going to call Dr. Losef. Mary says that she tried to call Ted at least 20 times between 3 and 8 p.m. Every time, the line was busy. At last, Mary got through. It's ringing, finally. No one's answering. I'm going to call the police again. Within the hour, police had found Ted's body. They suspected that Ted had killed himself. The discovery of a note in the upstairs bedroom bolstered their theory. However, to Mary, it was the first of several alarming discrepancies. I always thought that that note on the shirt cardboard was kind of strange. 
because I had been ironing Dr. Lusseff's shirts for a long time, and I always used a hanger. I never used a shirt cardboard. What are you saying? As she stared at Ted's body, Mary realized that something else was very wrong. When I last saw him, he was wearing brown pants and a kind of a mustard shirt. And now he had on gray pants and a dress shirt. And do you know, that whole time that I worked there, after Dr. Losef died, I never once saw those brown pants and that mustard colored shirt that he was wearing the last time I saw him. The discrepancies became impossible to ignore. In the kitchen, Mary found several empty beer cans and four dirty glasses. Ted rarely drank. Mrs. Lawson, can you come here a minute, please? A week later, Mary found odd stains on a bedspread in the guest room. This looks like vomit. Oh, uh, yes, this is, this is the dog's vomit. They were sick last night. However, Mary remembers the dogs being in a kennel at that time. Later, when she washed the bedspreads, the areas where the supposed dog vomit was had completely disintegrated. After hearing the housekeeper's many stories, I knew there was foul play and something terrible happened to Ted and that I had to find out. There is evidence of food fiber in the bronchi of the lungs. Four years after her son's death, Zell finally won a legal battle to have Ted's body exhumed for an autopsy. The pathologist found clear evidence that Ted had suffered a violent vomiting spell moments before his death. There should have been vomitus on his clothing, his face, and perhaps on the inside of the car. Why wasn't it there? This certainly strongly suggests to me that this vomiting occurred someplace other than in the car. And there were a number of discrepancies that have never been explained, but that very strongly move away from the whole thought of suicide. This, until proven otherwise, is a homicide. Fueled by the autopsy results, Zoll pieced together a theory explaining her son's death, a scenario of premeditated murder. Zell believes that Ted was assaulted soon after Wilda and Mary left the house. I believe that the people that killed my son were close to the wife because they knew that that back door would be open. The autopsy indicated that Ted had been involved in a struggle. Zell believes that he was overpowered by at least two men who forced poison down his throat. Ted was definitely fighting for his life, according to the doctors. Somebody took the phone off after they made sure he was dead. Then they uh, cleaned him up and they put his gray dress shirt on him. Then they went to the garage, emptied out the garage to make room for the car. Then they had to open the gates to put his car into this garage, carry his dead body into that garage, close the door, and then go out and close the gates. Then they went back into the house, I think, again, put the receiver back on the hook. Finally. All afternoon, Mary had been getting busy signals when she tried to call Ted. And now the phone was suddenly ringing. Zell believes that hanging up the phone was a prearranged signal from the killers to Wilda that their job was done. Eight years after Ted's death, the L.A. County coroner reopened the case. A witness told authorities that the so-called suicide note had indeed been written by Ted. But the witness also revealed that Ted wrote the message two years before his death, after an argument with Wilbur. The coroner's inquest ruled that Ted's death was a homicide. 
But before police could investigate, Ted's wife, Wilda, died of a drug and alcohol overdose. Investigators are stumped. It looks like someone may have gotten away with murder. If you have any information regarding this case, please log on to our website at unsolved.com. Next, former rock star Taylor Kramer makes a desperate phone call and then disappears. Los Angeles, California. Hello, can I help you? Yes, you can. I'm going to kill myself. Okay, what is your name? Hello? His name was Hello? Philip Taylor Kramer. Right after making that 9-11 call, he disappeared. His wife and the police are still trying to understand why. Philip, known to his friends as Taylor, was a bass player for the rock band Iron Butterfly during the 1970s. By the 1990s, Taylor had settled down with his wife, Jennifer, and their two children. Taylor was also a math and computer whiz who founded his own high-tech multimedia company. For several weeks before his disappearance, he had been working around the clock on a new breakthrough project. Is it? I don't know. He said, it's very simple. It's been here the whole time. It's so simple that no one has discovered it. I can't believe how close I am right now. And he said, imagine Jennifer, a computer and a camera being able to find a missing child in a sea of thousands of people by just showing the computer a small piece of that child's face and finding that child in a fraction of a second. To his wife, Jennifer, Taylor's behavior seemed to grow more and more bizarre. Sweetheart, the hand of hey. God has touched me. Taylor, calm down. You're going to twist an ankle. I can do ankle. no wrong. <sighs> He's sending me the truth, babe. The day before he disappeared, we went on a hike. And we hiked up to the top of a hill. And we look across and you can see the whole valley where we live and there's a cross up on the hill and he pointed to the cross and he said look honey our house is right in the path of this cross he started to see sacredness in everything like i said they're coming in at 11. the day after the hike taylor left home around 9 a.m he planned to pick up friends who were flying into town Taylor went to the airport as scheduled, but left before his friends arrived. From his car, he made a series of phone calls, including one to Ron Bushy, the drummer for Iron Butterfly. I love you more than life itself. His voice sounded stressed. Um, he sounded maybe like scared. Maybe he'd even been crying, I don't know. But apparently this cell phone call from his car was made to me. Um, and he also called Jennifer and a lot of other people. Hi, Jay. Listen, uh, tell Greg, tell Greg I'm not going to be able to meet him at the airport. He'll understand, OK? And I said, Taylor, where are you? Where are you going? What are you doing? Sweetheart, I want you to remember that whatever happens, I'll always be with you. And I started to get scared, and I thought, something is wrong with Taylor. And I said, where are you going? You just tell him that uh, I'll meet him at the hotel at 1, OK? And, and really calmly and lovingly, like he normally talks to me, he said, and when I see you, honey, I have a big surprise for you. But I knew in my gut that Taylor wasn't going to be at the hotel. I, I just knew that he wouldn't be there. One hour later, Taylor made his last contact, the call to 911. Hello, can I help you? Yes, you can. I'm going to kill myself. OK, what is your name? Hello? Hello? It, it's really hard to commit suicide and uh, take your life and, and disappear. I mean, somebody's going to find you. Somebody's going to find the car and the car and him are gone. 
No car, no body. Taylor's family was left wondering what happened and why. Update. Four years after Taylor's disappearance, two hikers exploring Decker Canyon near Malibu Beach discovered the rusted shell of his van. Taylor's remains were inside. The cause of death was blunt force trauma. But authorities cannot determine whether his death was a suicide, accident, or homicide. If you have any information about what happened to Philip Taylor Kramer, please log on to our website at unsolved.com. Next, some believe this portrait of Our Lady of Guadalupe is a miracle. And this infrared scan may prove them right. Mexico City, Mexico. These people are on a pilgrimage to worship before a painting that has been a source of inspiration and awe for more than 400 years. The image is that of the Virgin Mary, known here as Our Lady of Guadalupe. This image has sparked intense controversy. To skeptics, it is a skillful but ordinary painting. The Catholic Church, on the other hand, has officially recognized the image as a creation of God, a miracle that occurred over 300 years ago in Mexico. The debate continues to this day. According to church records, one of the first Aztecs to be converted to Christianity was a man named Juan Diego. He lived in a village just north of Mexico City. On a December morning in 1531, Juan was on his way to mass when he heard a voice calling his name. Juanito, Juanito el más humilde de mis hijos. ¿A dónde vas? He became entranced by the godlike radiance. Juan, Juanito. Sábete que soy la siempre Virgen María, Madre de Dios. Deseo sin demora que se construya un templo en mi honor, aquí, en el Cerro del Tepeyac. Te he elegido a ti como mi mensajero para que vayas con el obispo y le comuniques mi voluntad. Certain that he had experienced a miracle, Juan hurried to Mexico City to bring the news to the powerful bishop Juan de Zumaraga. Perdona, señora, pero me mandó la señora del cielo para decirte que desea que se le construya un templo en su honor en el cerro del Tepeyac. ¿Qué dices, hijo mío? The bishop was skeptical and told Juan to bring him proof. Dejected, Juan returned home where he found that his uncle was dying. The next day, Juan went to find a priest to perform last rites. His route took him back to Tepeyac Hill. Voy en camino a buscar al sacerdote. Querido Juanito, no será necesario. Tu tío sanará completamente. Gracias, señora. To Juan's amazement, even though it was winter, the hilltop was covered in beautiful roses. He gathered them in his cape made of cactus cloth. Aquí está la señal que te envía Nuestra Señora del Cielo para que cumpla su voluntad. According to church documents where the flowers had rested in the cape, there appeared a perfect image of the Virgin Mary. The bishop now believed that a miracle had occurred and agreed to build the shrine. Today, the shrine stands on Tepeyac Hill with the image of the Virgin on prominent display. The painting was named Our Lady of Guadalupe after a village in Spain. Over the centuries, the church has allowed painted details to be added to the portrait, including gold rays all around the figure. Every year, five million believers make a pilgrimage to view the image. But for as long as it has existed, there has been debate over whether the portrait is truly 
a miracle. In 1789, a skeptical priest ordered 11 artists to make a copy of the painting using the same kind of untreated cactus cloth as the original. After only seven years, all 11 were so peeled and coated with fungus that they had to be removed from public display. I think that the fact that the image has lasted for over four, almost 500 years now, the fact that the original picture, the pigment on the original picture is still just like it always was and hasn't cracked is another totally inexplicable thing. In modern times, experts were given formal permission to examine the image up close. Naturally enough, we examined the face most uh, intensely and uh, studying this with a magnifying glass, we could see no hairline cracks. Whatever the medium used to color it was, uh, it's very strange because after uh, all of these years with no evidence of retouching, uh, there's no evidence of, of uh, age uh, disfiguration. In fact, the gold rays around the Virgin added in the 17th century are badly chipped, but the original image is not. Still, that wasn't enough to convince the skeptics. It's gone through so many changes over the years, of course, and so many different representations have been made of it and for it, that it's really hard to tell what happened to the original or if this is the original. You can't tell. There's really so little evidence available. These infrared photographs reveal another surprising aspect of the painting. The film photographs, the infrared photographs showed that there is absolutely no drawing under it. Uh, it's inconceivable that an artist in the 16th century would paint a portrait without first doing a drawing of it. In fact, it's fairly inconceivable any artist would do it today, although you could do it with some modern art thing, but not with a portrait. The absence of the undersketch in itself does not categorically uh, indicate a miracle. But to paint uh, uh, as beautiful a face and, and bust as we see in Our Lady of Guadalupe on a rough cactus cloth is all the more remarkable. Perhaps no amount of scientific research will unlock the mystery of Our Lady of Guadalupe. For the true believers, there is no controversy. To them, the beautiful face of the Virgin Mary is purely and simply miraculous. Up next, a father and a daughter reunite after 20 years. Thanks to your calls. Recently, we told you the story of Soon Van Nguyen, who immigrated to America from Vietnam with his family in 1993. Soon had come both to start a new life and to complete some unfinished business from his old one. Soon's first visit to America was in 1968, at the height of the Vietnam War. As a South Vietnamese officer, Soon was sent to a U.S. Air Force base in Louisiana for jet pilot training. During his stay there, Soon fell in love with a woman named Gwendolyn Gautier. But with his training complete, he was sent back to Vietnam to fight for his country. A few months after his return, he received a letter from America. Gwendolyn was pregnant. I'm gonna be a father. Hey, do that, yeah? Do that, yeah? <laughs> Coming back from a tense mission and hearing the good news, I was so happy at that moment. Five years later, Soon was sent to Louisiana once again. He met his daughter, Kimberly, for the first time. And I looked at her and knew right away that this was my child. Kimberly, this is Soon. Soon? Soon was able to spend a whole month with Kimberly before he had to return to Vietnam and the war. After the war ended, Soon was captured and imprisoned for nearly 10 years in what was known as a re-education camp. Another 10 years passed before he finally made it to America. But Soon never stopped thinking of the little girl that he had left behind so long ago. 
And on our program, he asked if someone in our audience could help reunite them. Update. The night that this story aired, we received calls from Kimberly's friends and family. Kimberly had been searching for her father and was thrilled at the idea of seeing him again. They met in Pineville, Louisiana. Soon, and his American sponsor traveled there for the long-awaited reunion with Kimberly. It was their first moment together in more than 20 years. Oh, Kim. <laughs> Hi. Hey. Oh, good to see you. Soon was overcome with emotion. It was just, you can't describe the feeling. It was just like, <sighs> nice. <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't do the feeling justice, but it was just incredible, fantastic, wonderful, <laughs> great. <laughs> Soon then celebrated with 20 members of Kimberly's family, including her mother, Gwendolyn, who had always wanted Kimberly to know her father. And if it's too long, to see them together is just a dream come true. Yeah, I'm telling you. A fairy tale that uh, had had some bad detours, but it came to a happy ending. Oh, oh no! <laughs> That's not fair. Oh, this is a big day. A happy day. I, I think I cannot forget it. Swings, slides. Yeah. In many of our cases, we've seen the lives of ordinary people change forever in an instant. This next story, which begins in Davenport, Florida, is another of these dramatic stories. I've been out of here 15 Did minutes Did you pack ago. the fruit? Yes, I have the fruit. I have everything packed. John and Virginia yes. Constable were packing to visit their daughter, Linda, in Jacksonville, a three-hour drive away. They had called uh, about 12.15. And mom said, well, I guess we're going to be on our way up. And that was the last time I heard her voice over the phone. You call Linda? I called her. I talked to her just before we left. Ten oh, minutes later, the constables were still just a few miles from their home, heading north on Country Road 545. Just ahead, traveling southbound, was a pickup truck driven by a house painter named James White. He had been drinking. Minutes after the accident, the highway patrol and rescue teams were on the scene. John died on impact. Virginia was suffering from massive internal injuries. James White had some broken bones, but nothing life-threatening. I directed my attention to Mr. White, who was the single occupant in the pickup truck, and he was placed in the ambulance, and I got in the back of the ambulance with him at which time I could smell the odor of alcoholic beverage. I'm Trooper Brewer, Florida Highway Patrol, okay? I'm on request... The test showed a blood alcohol level of 0.22, more than twice Florida's legal limit of 0.10. White was taken to Kissimmee Memorial Hospital 12 miles away. Virginia was medevac to a trauma center in Orlando. Nearly every organ in her body had been ruptured. She died at the hospital. Highway patrol officers went to the home of John and Virginia's daughter, Linda, to deliver the news. Hello, Mr. Faulkner? Yes. I'm Sergeant Hoyle with Highway Patrol. Thank you for answering our call so soon. It's all right. Unfortunately, I'm here to advise you that Mr. and Mrs. Constable were involved in a serious accident earlier this afternoon. Are they all right? No, ma'am, I'm He afraid. said that there had been an automobile accident. And there was a fatality. Sure. Yes, sir, I'm sure. I just remember asking which one. I never dreamed it would have been both of them. 
And after that, I don't remember anything. Hey, Jimmy, how you doing, bud? White had suffered a fractured jaw, a broken ankle, and three broken ribs. He was admitted to the intensive care unit where his relatives stayed with him day and night. Three days after the accident, White's condition had improved considerably. Hey, where are y'all going? Uh, just out for a walk. OK, visiting hours are over. If you can have them back in 30 minutes? No problem. OK, thanks. His family apparently was walking him a little bit each day. And the third day, apparently, they kept right on walking. James White was gone. Only later did authorities discover that he had a long history of drunk driving arrests. White and his relatives have not been seen since. Update. James White has been arrested. Anything to say, Mr. White? Following the broadcast of Unsolved Mystery, we received some 200 phone calls about James White and his whereabouts. Two days after the Unsolved Mysteries broadcast, we got the phone call we were waiting on. James White was spotted by someone who had seen the program up in Burlington, Vermont. He was seen in a bar, and he was arrested and taken into custody up there. James White pleaded no contest to two counts of DUI manslaughter and was sentenced to 11 years in prison. His license? was permanently revoked, and he was required to pay $12,000 to cover burial expenses for John and Virginia Constable. White was released from prison after serving four years. This mystery was solved with your help, but others remain. If you have any information about any cases in this program, please log on to our website at unsolved.com.